that you is. Okay, now now we're okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. We're back for our afternoon session with uh, Professor Jose Manuel Munoz, and uh, our debater will be Professor uh, Leonardo Martins Vicrota. Uh, he's a postdoctoral researcher at uh, the Federal University of Minas Gerais, PhD in law from the Pontif Pontifical Catholic University of Minas Gerais, LLM in procedural law from uh, the Pontifical Catholic University of Minas Gerais, member of the Civil Procedure Commission of a uh, OAB. Uh, it's, it's our bar association uh, in, in Minas Gerais, Brazil, and also an attorney and a great friend and the, the birthday, uh, the, the what, what is the, it's his birthday today. So congratulations, Leonardo. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Renato. It's really a gift uh, and an honor to be here today with such great researchers. And, and, and thank you especially for the invitation and for, uh, thank you for you. Thank you to you and Professor Gabriel. It's an, really an honor uh, to be here. And I would like to introduce you to Professor Jose Manuel Munoz. He's a philosopher, a neuroscientist and a, and a writer working actually at, as a postdoctoral fellow in neuroethics at the University of Navarra and at Tatiana Foundation International Center for Neuroscience and Ethics, the SINET. Previously, he served as an assistant professor of psychology at the European University of Valencia in 2018 to, 2000 to, to nowadays. And also he was a visiting scholar at the National Institute of Criminal Science of Mexico he also received his PhD in logic and history and philosophy of science from the UNED in 2016, and also a BMS MS in biology from the University of Valencia. Uh, well, his areas of specialization are neuroethics, cognitive neuroscience, especially philosophy of mind. His work in these areas has been published in numerous academic and popular outlets, such as Nature, Philosophical, Psychology, Frontiers in Psychology, and among others. And Professor Munoz has also taught neural law at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, the UNITAR, and also taught biology and neuropsychology, among other subjects, at other institutions. Uh, for us, He's also invited professor at Latin American Observatory for Human Rights and Enterprises of the Externado University of Colombia. Also served as a review editor from the journal Frontiers in Psychology for the section on theoretical and, psych and socio-physical psychology. And, and that at, at the academic secretary of Mexican, of Mexican Association of Neuroethics, the AMNI. Uh, he's also a member of the association for the scientific study of consciousness at the International Neurotic Society and the Spanish Society for Logic and the Methodology in, Phil in Philosophy of Science. So as you all can see, we are in front of a huge researcher and it's a great honor to have you here with us today, Professor Jose Manuel Munoz, and to speak about uh, a, a talk up with entitled should free will be introduced as a human right? Uh, and that's an important question. And now uh, the word is yours, Professor. We are, we are, it's an honor to us to hear you from now on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leonardo. The honor is, uh, is really mine. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, it is really a pleasure to be here with such extraordinary speakers and I want to thank you uh, to all the organizing committee for inviting me to be part of this amazing event. I'm going to share my screen now. And I hope it looks well. So. Uh, my talk is titled Should Free Will Be Introduced as a, as a New Human Right, as a Human Right. Um, first of all, uh, I'm going to summarize what my talk is uh, going to be about. Um, 
In this talk, I will discuss the idea of whether it is convenient to safeguard uh, personal autonomy regarding the use of neurotechnologies by introducing free will as a new human right, as proposed by the Columbia Neural Rights Initiative. To do so, I will present some conceptual, cultural, contextual, and regulatory issues that this introduction could entail. I will also compare the right to free will with that of uh, cognitive freedom, which I consider a less demanding form of personal autonomy. And uh, also I will present a practical example in which I will argue, by which I will argue that this is possible uh, to implement public policies that introduce neurotechnological and cognitive tools to study criminal recidivism while being fully respectful to our inmates' autonomy in the form of cognitive freedom and without appealing to the right to free will. I will call this approach neuroprevention. So uh, let me start uh, by, um, by presenting how free will could be considered as a new human right, the so-called neuro rights. Uh, to do so, I will present I will try to define what neuro rights are. In a way, uh, we can see neuro rights as a conceptual reflection, uh, to say so, of neuro law in a mirror. Uh, while neuro law could be considered as neuroscience applied to the legal realm, neuro rights could be considered a form of legal, uh, of legal regulation applied to the neuroscientific uh, realm. As we will see, neuro rights are not just any form of legal regulation of neuroscientific practice, but rather are conceived as the supreme mode of regulation. It is important to state that uh, the first uh, scholars that proposed uh, that new human rights should be applied in regard to the use of neuroscience uh, and neurotechnology were Marcello Yenka from Italy and Roberto Andorno from Argentina, although they both uh, work at universities in uh, Switzerland. Uh, in this seminal paper titled Towards New Human Rights in the Age of Neuroscience and Neurotechnology, published in uh, 2017, they proposed to incorporate four new human rights called, as we will see later, the right to cognitive liberty, an important one today, the right to mental privacy, the right, the right to mental integrity, and the right to psychological continuity. In a sense, uh, we are talking about new human rights, that uh, some authors have proposed should be introduced to face or rather to anticipate the challenges that, uh, that an inappropriate or malicious use of neuroscience and neurotechnology could bring with them. But uh, the really well-known uh, proposal of new human rights is that of the Columbia Neural Rights Initiative which has uh, received a lot of, uh, of attention in mainstream media. Uh, this has uh, indeed a website, uh, the website of the Neural Rights Initiative. And in this website, you will find that they propose five uh, neural rights. Uh, please note that one of them is the one that uh, inter in that has an intersection with the proposal by Yenka and Andorno. I am talking about the right to mental privacy. The rest of the neuro rights proposed by the neuro rights initiative are different to those uh, proposed by Yenka and Andorno. These neuro rights are the following. The right to personal identity, uh, which states that boundaries must be developed to prohibit technology from disrupting the sense of self. When neurotechnology connects individuals with digital networks, it could be blurred the line between a person's consciousness 
and external technological inputs. The second one, uh, which has the leading role today, is the right to free will, uh, by which individuals should have ultimate control over their own decision making without unknown manipulation from external neurotechnologies. The third, uh, the third one is the right to mental privacy, according to which any data obtained from measuring neural activity, also called neurodata, should be kept private. Moreover, the sale, commercial transfer, and use of neural data should be strictly regulated. The fourth is the right to equal access to mental augmentation, by which there should be established guidelines at both international and national levels, regulating the development and applications of mental enhancement neurotechnologies. And the last one is the right to protection from algorithmic bias, by which countermeasures to combat bias should be the norm for machine learning. So uh, this proposal by, by Rafael Juste and, and other scientists in the Neural Rights Colombia Initiative um, uh, has started to be proposed uh, after the publication of some seminal papers. Importantly, this paper uh, which, which you have uh, at the left side of the, of the screen, published in Nature, for ethical priorities for new technologies and artificial intelligence. But after the initiative has been launched, there have been uh, two additional uh, important papers. Uh, we will be talking about one of them, uh, this one by Juste and, and collaborators in the journal Horizons entitled It's Time for New Rights. There are also additional papers, such as this one in the neuro, uh, in the neuroethics, uh, the journal Neuroethics. Uh, the proposal, the neuro rights proposal by Justin collaborators, the neuro rights initiative proposal, has, uh, has arrived to Chile, uh, a country in which, uh, in fact, there has been approved a new um, a new legal regulation of neuro rights, which has been incorporated to their new constitution, among other things, not only neuro rights, uh, there are also other things incorporated, but importantly, here is that neuro rights has been, uh, have been incorporated uh, in Chile at their constitution. It is the first time ever that new rights are incorporated at any realm, but particularly at the national realm and national constitutions in this case. As you will see, the text is obviously in Spanish, but I will uh, translate for you the last paragraph, which states the following. Scientific and technological development will be at the service of people and will be carried out with respect to life and physical and mental integrity. The law will regulate the requirements and conditions for its use in people and should be directed especially to the protection of brain activity and the information that comes from it. So as we would say, there are uh, not all the, the not all of the five neuro rights proposed by Houston collaborators are have been incorporated in Chile, but uh, there are two neuro rights incorporated. More uh, specifically, the neuro rights incorporated are those of um, mental integrity and also the right to mental privacy. The second place in which uh, the neuro rights have been uh, incorporated is Spain, my country. Uh, in Spain, uh, there is a new charter of digital rights in which, uh, in fact, the five neuro rights proposed by, by the Neuro Rights Initiative have been incorporated, all of them. But the most interesting uh, initiative, uh, in my opinion, is that, that recently has been launched in Brazil, in your country, or the country of the most of the people here today. Uh, this Proyecto de Ley, this bill, 
is intended to modify a prior uh, regulation by which um, in this new um, in this new regulation is intended to incorporate uh, mental privacy or more concretely the protection of uh, neural data neural data in order to amplify a uh, previous law um, about personal protection of personal data. Uh, let me say that this Brazilian approach is the one I like the most of the three. I consider that a minimalist incorporation of neural rights, so to speak, is the best strategy at this uh, stage in which it is still not entirely clear how to define each neural right and in which areas they should be incorporated. The extension of data protection to include neural data in this sense, and although I am not familiar with Brazilian legislation, it seems reasonable and not very problematic from a conceptual point of view. This is my opinion. Well, this has to do with something that seems uh, fundamental to me fostering an academic and scholarly debate on the content, the definition, and the scope of neural rights. There have already been some steps forward in this regard. For example, a workshop entitled Neural Rights in Chile, the Philosophical Debate, uh, which has recently been organized and sponsored by the Alberto Hurtado University and the Columbia University. The first book about neural rights will also be soon be published uh, as a special issue of the journal Frontiers in Human Neuroscience. I have had the honor of being a co-editor for this issue along with professors Eric Garcia Lopez from the National Institute of Criminal Sciences uh, of Mexico and Roberto Andorno, one of the neural rights pioneers as we have seen uh, yet. But there are uh, Apart from the scholarly work published in journals or, or the talks in workshops, there have been new research initiatives that have been created at the Latin American uh, regional, uh, regional level, regional sphere. Um, as far as I know, there are three new research initiatives, uh, which are the following. The first one is, uh, has been launched by the Mexican Association of uh, Neuroethics, uh, led by Professor Karen Herrera. Um, in this uh, association, many task force or working groups have been created. One of them is uh, a task force on neuro rights. A second initiative at Latin America is uh, that of the PhD program uh, recently created by two national institutes uh, in Mexico. Uh, more concretely, I'm talking about the National Institute of Criminal Sciences and the National Institute uh, for Neurology and Neurosurgery. Um, this is a very interesting uh, program, in my opinion, an interdisciplinary uh, program about neuro law and forensic uh, psychopathology. And one of the main uh, research lines is that of neuro rights. And the third uh, research initiative is that of the Externado University of uh, Colombia, whose uh, Latin American Observatory for Human Rights and Enterprises has uh, recently created a new research line on human rights, uh, human neural rights and technologies. So uh, we could summarize the pending challenges about neural rights, which in my opinion are, are a lot. There are lots of uh, pending challenges, uh, at least at the conceptual level. Um, let me summarize briefly some of them. Uh, the first one is, is related to the consensus definitions of each of the neural rights. Uh, there is still um, a discussion uh, pending about how we should define 
and depict uh, the content um, for each of the new rights. This is one thing that will be an important thing uh, in what follows uh, when I will um, focus uh, concretely on the free will, the right to free will. A second challenge is that of uh, taxonomy and inter interdependencies between the different new rights. We should, in my opinion, think about or think whether it is uh, a hierarchy of uh, rights, if one right depends on each other. A third one is, a third challenge is uh, whether the new rights should be absolute rights or relative rights. Think about, uh, for example, think about mental privacy. Uh, there is a uh, increasing debate about uh, whether this right should be an absolute right, uh, which means that should be a right protected in any uh, context and any circum uh, circumstances, or it uh, or whether it should be a relative right. I mean, uh, a right that should be uh, only applied in specific uh, situations. Uh, a fourth challenge is that of the legal pertinence. Uh, are new rights legally pertinent or uh, on the contrary, there is a risk of uh, regulatory inflation? Uh, this is a thing that I believe it, it's very important. And I believe that the response to this question will depend on which uh, realm we are considering. Uh, it is not uh, the same, the Brazilian legislation, for example, or the Spanish legislation or the Chilean legislation, to say the three examples that I mentioned uh, previously. The fifth uh, challenge is that of cultural, regional, and national context, uh, which is intimately uh, related to the previous challenge. Um, how the neuro rights um, could influence or could be influenced by the different cultural uh, mentalities and the different national and regional contexts. Another one, another challenge is, uh, it's an important question in my opinion, and it is, uh, what are the suitable discussion forums for this topic? Uh, should we discuss about neuro rights at a specific commission in the national and in, in the United Nations, or should we discuss it at the national level in national parliaments, or even we should discuss uh, this in regional uh, forums, for example, the uh, Inter American uh, Court of Human Rights based in Costa Rica, to say an example. So there are uh, many pending challenges. Uh, this is a topic of uh, new rights that it, it's uh, in the first stage of academic debate. So I think it is a very exciting topic to discuss about with, uh, with many, uh, many of you and many of the people in the audience. But there, are, uh, there is an additional question that I think it's essential. And it is a question of why now? Why should we incorporate new rights now? Why in the 2020s and not in the 2030s or in the 2040s, well, to say? Uh, in other words, may neurotechnology really pose a threat to our free will? This is the question. It is legitimate to wonder whether neuro rights are nothing more than the legal site of uh, neuro hype. The question, uh, sorry, because I think it is okay. The question is can advances in neuroscience really be the potentially uh, that potentially harmful to human rights if they fall into the wrong hands? This is a question. Take, for example, a recent case that has occurred in some Chinese schools where brainwave detecting headgears have been used to monitor the degree of attention of children towards the explanations of their teachers. These headgears only have three, three sensors. 
and they can also be easily dislodged. So it seems that they are not really very useful for the purposes that are theoretically pursued with them. We would then, um, we would then be uh, leading uh, with another case of neurohype. And so the rights of children would not really be at risk. Let's think, however, that beyond the real usefulness of these devices, there could be uh, their use could be conditioning the behavior of children who could feel watched and stressed so that their free will seems to be being affected in some way. Here is another case taken from an experimental uh, study uh, published in the journal Cell, in which neuroscientists have achieved um, to modify the behavior, to modify choices of, uh, of mice. Um, specifically, they have employed uh, optogenetic stimulation by which they have achieved to elicit hunting, predatory hunting uh, behavior uh, towards life and artificial prey. Another example, the last, the last uh, example, I will, note, I will not go in depth here. The last example is that of uh, use of ultrasound brain stimulation in monkeys. In these experiments, neuroscientists have achieved also to uh, modify decisions of, uh, of monkeys. This is an interesting one because um, when you see at the optogenetic stimulation, this is an invasive uh, technique, but the ultrasound brain stimulation is a non-invasive technique. So uh, it it seems it, it could seem if it, uh, it seems that um, this could be more easily used in the future uh, with human beings. Of course, there would be much to debate about to what extent these achievements could be applied to human beings and to what extent there is a real risk that these techniques will be used for non-therapeutic purposes, but to try to manipulate people's decisions for economic, political or uh, military purposes, to name a few. Uh, but I think uh, the brief examples I just mentioned sufficiently show the potential risk of these techniques to affect free will, or at least to affect personal autonomy if we choose a somewhat less loaded term. Uh, therefore, I believe that the preliminary idea of protecting free will as a right before entering into further considerations is not in, it, in itself an idea that comes from nowhere. Uh, in other words, I essentially agree with the general framework of anticipating potential risks to personal autonomy and other traits through specific uh, strong regulations. Okay, but uh, being, uh, well, although I, am, I agree with the general framework of the incorporation of new human rights, I believe there are several uh, conceptual challenges uh, that should be taken into account and I think we should debate about them. Um, I will now present a list of five challenges uh, on, this, on, this, uh, on this question. Uh, all of them have to do with conceptual, cultural, contextual and regulatory issues. Le let's turn back to the specific definition of the right to free will proposed by the Neuro Rights Initiative at Columbia University. The right to free will, again, is individuals should have ultimate control over their own decision making without unknown manipulation from external neurotechnologies. This is the definition proposed. But, um, this definition is not a definitive definition, and Juste and colleagues, colleagues uh, 
are aware of this. Uh, they recognize this question. And they have recently stated that, that there is a need of searching for consensus, consensus definitions of the different neural rights, uh, not only free will, but, but all of the neural rights proposed by this initiative. Uh, in this publication, this recent publication in the journal Horizons, they concretely say the following, short term measures could help build a consensus definition of neural rights and thereby consolidate neurotechnology research and regulatory practices. Uh, they, also, uh, they also propose to create an international science and law expert commission on neural rights at the United Nations level, okay? Uh, and, and they also state that the commission could draw its members from academia, the private sector, and from non-governmental organizations. This commission would specifically aim to develop an international consensus definition of neural rights. So, as I said, uh, they are aware that the consensus definition of uh, the different new rights is it still to be debated. And as I mentioned before, I will present now five challenges related to this topic. Uh, in, in a way, it is a, a personal response to, to, this, uh, to this call, um, a small response, but a personal res response to this call. I will now present five challenges and correspondence and corresponding lines of action as an initial attempt to establish a conceptual discussion framework for a consensus definition for the neural right to free will. Let's start with the challenges uh, without the following. The first one is philosophical multidimensionality. The second, ultimate control. The third is cultural contextualization. The fourth one is regulatory fitting. And the fifth one is uh, how free will, uh, which dependencies uh, we could find between free will and cognitive liberty. I will go on detail on each of these uh, challenges. Well, the first, the first challenge is that of philosophical, of philosophical multidimensionality. As uh, you know, um, free will has traditionally been considered a uh, somewhat uh, conceptual bridge between philosophy and criminal law. Uh, free will, in this sense, would be a pre-requirement to attributability and imputability. Uh, but free will seems to be a problematic concept when we think about the concept of determinism. Um, let's see, for example, this definition by Van Inwagen, by Peter Van Inwagen in his uh, An Essay on Free Will, a short definition, but I think this is a short but uh, great definition. Determinism is intuitively the thesis that given the past and the laws of nature, there is only one possible future. Uh, okay, but why is there a conflict? Uh, between or, or why apparently uh, there is a conflict between determinism and free will. We could respond to this question by appealing to the consequence argument. Uh, the, con the, con the consequence argument in Van Wagen words, uh, it states the following. If determinism is true, then our acts are the consequence of the laws of nature and events in the remote past but it's not up to us what went on before we were born and neither is it up to us what the laws of nature are. Therefore, the consequences of these things, including our present acts, are not up to us. So it, this is why uh, determinism and free will uh, in at a first glance uh, seem to be incompatible. Um, Let's put it allegorically through this painting of one of the universal geniuses of my country, Spain. Uh, I'm talking about Francisco de Goya. Uh, just, as, uh, just as the two men in the painting buried in the mud seem doomed to beat each other to death, 
we as agents would be doomed by the past and natural laws to behave in ways beyond our control. Free will, uh, if we see it this way, would seem impossible if determinism is true. Okay, with this underlying problem in mind, the different answers have been given that involve a whole range of positions. Professor Amaya highlighted in his interesting talk yesterday that one way of looking at free will is as a spectrum of degrees of freedom. Uh, here we can also, uh, we maybe can also speak about the spectrum Although in this case, it is a spectrum of positions uh, that make the problem of free will a multidimensional problem. Of course, many of the people in the audience will be familiar with this topic, uh, so I won't go into depth here. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. um, in order to understand which are the main positions about free will, uh, we could uh, appeal to two pre-requirements uh, that has been traditionally uh, uh, proposed as requirements of uh, free will. The first one is alternative possibilities, uh, which means that an agent has two or more robust alternatives for action. And the second one is the ultimate control requirement by which uh, the agent is the ultimate source and genuine author for an action. With these requirements in mind, we could classify the different positions, as many of you know, uh, in two main positions, uh, two main schools of thought, if we can say so. Uh, the, the first one is compatibilism. Uh, compatibilists uh, believe that determinism and free will are compatible because determinism does not preclude uh, alternative possibilities or ultimate control, or maybe because uh, alternative possibilities and ultimate control are not indispensable for free will. The second main uh, position is that of incompatibilism, uh, by which determinism and free will are not compatible because determinism precludes um, alternative possibilities and ultimate control. But uh, in the compatibilism school, we have three positions, or three main positions. The first one is libertarianism. Uh, libertarians believe that, yes, determinism precludes free will, but determinism isn't true. So we do have free will. In contrast, we have the hard determinists uh, who believe that determinism precludes free will, but determinism is true, so we don't have free will. And uh, the last position I would like to, to stress here is hard incompatibilism. Uh, hard incompatibilists believe that determinism precludes free will, but also that free will is incompatible with indeterminism, which entails randomness in their opinion. So we don't have free will after all, uh, either uh, uh, neither in a deterministic nor are uh, nor in a indeterministic uh, world. To complicate things even more, there is a wide set of experiments that seem to challenge the existence of free will, such as the Milgram and the Stanford Prison psychological experiments. Uh, as well as the Libet style experiments, uh, to mention just uh, the, the best known of them. Um, but in response, counter arguments have been offered, arguing that neuroscience has not disproved free will. Among these authors, we find, for example, Alfred Melly and also Professor Marcel Brass, who made his presentation early, uh, earlier at this event. So in sum, uh, we have a conclusion, uh, a conclusion that may be rather obvious for those, who, uh, those of us who are here today, but perhaps not so much for those who are dedicated exclusively to neuroscience and not to the philosophies of mind and action. The conclusion is that there is a wide range of answers to the philosophical problem of compatibility between determinism and free will.
this is the first challenge, the, philosoph the philosophical multidimensionality challenge. The second challenge to the uh, that we could um, that we could mention about the uh, neural right to free will. The second challenge is the ultimate control challenge. Uh, as you know, ultimate control is a very problematic uh, concept concept uh, in uh, debates uh, in philosophy of action, and it is. Uh, well, it, it, I think it's surprising, or uh, I, I cannot find the, the the word. Yeah, I think it's surprising that uh, the um, Neo Rights Initiative has incorporated this uh, this term. Um, let's remember the definition: individuals should have ultimate control over their own decision making, etc. Um, as I as I mentioned, uh, this is a very problematic. Concept, the concept of ultimate control, which has received uh, lots of criticisms. Um, I think that we could summarize these criticisms uh, through the criticism based on in infinite regress, uh, which has been uh, stressed by, among others, by Garland Strossum, as Timothy O'Connor uh, expla uh, explains in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, uh, Garland Strossum associates free will with being ultimately morally responsible for one's actions. He argues that because how one acts is, is a result of or explained by how one is, mentally speaking, M. For one to be responsible for that choice, one must be responsible for M. To be responsible for M, one must have chosen to be M itself, and that not blindly, but deliberately, in accordance with some reasons R1. But for that choice to be a responsible one, one must have chosen to be such as to move by R1, requiring some further reasons R2 for such a choice, and so on ad infinitum. Free choice requires an impossible infinite regress of choices to be the way one is in making choices. So it, this is the, the classical infinite regress uh, argument uh, against the requirement of ultimate control. So uh, in sum, the ultimate control challenge is that while libertarians see ultimate control as an essential requirement for free will, this is criticized from other positions. A third challenge is that of cultural contextualization. There is increasing evidence that uh, free will could be a cultural construct in, so in many ways. Uh, let's see, for example, this study uh, conducted by um, Cherniak and collaborators in this study with Singaporean and US children, uh, they showed that while the former were more likely to elaborate on lack of free will by referencing punishment and or having to seek permission from authorities, the latter tended to endorse the freedom to act against norms. A second interesting uh, publication is this one by Bernunas and collaborators. In this uh, publication, they found that the concept, well, it's a review, but they found that the concept of free will has no cross-culturally universal conceptual content. Uh, and also that most of the reviewed studies uh, on belief in free will were based on weird, uh, weird samples. Um, to those who are not familiar with the acronym weird, weird means Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. So uh, most of the studies on beliefs in free will are based on, uh, in this uh, kind of, um, of people. Uh, they concluded, and Bernunas and collaborators concluded that the term free will is inadequate for cross-cultural research. And specifically, they reveal that culturally diverse uh, lexical expressions of free will, namely Chinese, Hindi, Lithuanian and Mongolian languages do not refer to the same concept of free will. 
Uh, last study that, that I would like to mention here is this very interesting um, study by Wisniewski uh, and collaborators. Uh, among them is uh, John Dylan Haynes. Uh, they showed that believing in a dualistic self made up of, of a physical brain and a non-physical mind seems to have a decisive influence on believing in free will and pointed out religious and after death beliefs as a possible cause. Uh, this study has been uh, conducted uh, by using the free will inventarium. So these findings invite us to consider culturally shaped factors such as social norms, languages and beliefs as fundamental factors within an international debate aimed to find a consensus definition of neural rights in general and free will in particular. The challenge then is that several uh, studies show that free will is a culturally changing concept and also that Western societies, or at least their weird individuals, give higher priority to free will as a value than do Eastern ones. This challenge is related, uh, by the way, to a very important idea that Professor Renato Cardoso highlighted in his presentation is that our beliefs and conceptions about free, uh, what free will is and whether it exists or not may decisively influence the way in which law is understood and applied. A fourth challenge about the new right uh, to free will is that of regulatory fitting. Uh, importantly, the ultimate goal of the new rights initiative is for these new rights to be incorporated through a reform or expansion of the a universal declaration of human rights. So it is important for me to, uh, to mention here three examples in order to uh, make an argument. Um, let's see the first example, uh, which is article uh, 16.2, which states that marriage shall be entered into only with the free and full consent of the intending spouses. Article 18 states, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, conscience and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship and observance. And the last example is Article 21.3, which states that the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government. This will shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections, which shall be by universal and equal suffrage and shall be held by secret vote or by equivalent free voting procedures. Um, as we have seen in these examples, free will seems to be present in different parts of the, of the Universal Declaration. In particular, these, are, these articles, uh, these three articles seem to take into account uh, free will as understood uh, specifically by classical compatibilism. That is, uh, classical compatibilism, if we remember, say that we are free if we can do what we had decided to do and if there are neither constraints nor coercions that prevent us from doing it. So in a way, I think that free will is uh, actually incorporated into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So the question is, uh, should we incorporate free will uh, in this declaration, the challenge? Uh, in other words, would be, is it necessary to include free will as a new hum human right, considering that freedom of decision and action seem to be expressed for different culturally shaped daily life contexts by several articles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, namely free marriage, free thought, free voting? And the last challenge, the fifth uh, challenge, is that of the relationship between free will and another new right, uh, which is cognitive liberty. Importantly, we should uh, mention that free will is a new right proposed by the New Rights Initiative 
Um, but cognitive liberty is, uh, you're right, proposed by Yenka Anandorno in his seminal paper, uh, which I mentioned uh, previously. Um, well, uh, I should say that cognitive liberty is a legal principle that has been discussed since the beginning of this century, but for the specific case of its application in relation to the use of neurotechnologies, Yenka and Andorno have been those who have proposed incorporating it as a new human right. Um, this right um, specifically comprises two fundamental and intimately related principles, which are first, the right of individuals to use emerging neurotechnologies. This is the positive, um, the positive side of this of this right, this is a positive liberty to exert, uh, exert a liberty in a positive way. Uh, second, the protection of individuals from the coercive and unconsented use of such technologies. This is the negative side, it's, it's a negative liberty. So we have uh, that cognitive liberty is both a positive liberty and a negative liberty. It depends on how you interpret the situation and the context of how it is used or how it is uh, exercised. Um, importantly, Yenka Landorno stressed that being the neurocognitive substrate of all other liberties, cognitive liberty cannot be reduced to existing rights, hence is immune to the risk of rights inflation as it is the free will, as it is not the case of, uh, of free will. So if we summarize this, uh, um, well, previously, I, I should say that, as we can see, uh, cognitive liberty entails a more practical understanding of personal autonomy than free will, in my opinion. Uh, this is an understanding that is linked to a specific situation of personally deciding whether or not you want to use a neurotechnology in a specific situation. So I think, and this is an important uh, part of my documentation, I think that uh, free will is a ontological conception of personal autonomy. I'm not discovering nothing with it, but cognitive liberty refers either to practical freedom of thought or to specific practical choices. So it's a uh, the term free will, in my opinion, is uh, more loaded than that of uh, cognitive freedom in many senses. You know? So, uh, as mentioned earlier, um, my goal was to present five challenges and corresponding lines of action as an initial attempt to establish a conceptual discussion framework for a consensus definition uh, for the neural right to free will. I uh, have presented the challenges and now I will briefly suggest the corresponding lines of action. Regarding the first challenge, which was that uh, there is a wide range of answers to the philosophical problem of compatibility between uh, determinism and free will, the proposed line of action would be to explore whether a minimal conception can be found in which all the theoretical approaches converge or alternatively, whether it is convenient to choose only one to develop a consensus definition. Regarding the second challenge, which was ultimate control, while libertarians see ultimate control as an essential requirement for free will, this is criticized from other positions. In response to this challenge, the corresponding line of action would be to elaborate on whether including ultimate control means aligning with libertarianism or alternatively seek a definition that dispenses with this concept, with this very problematic concept. In regard to the third challenge, cultural contextualization, uh, Several studies show that free will is a culturally changing concept and also that Western societies give higher priority to free will as a value than do Eastern ones. The proposed corresponding line of action is to study whether and how a normative formalization of free will as a universal right or value 
can encompass its diverse cultural conceptions. For the fourth uh, challenge, regulatory fitting, uh, is it necessary to include free wills and new human rights, considering that freedom of decision and action seem to be expressed for different, uh, for different contexts by several articles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Uh, my proposed line of action would be to explore uh, to determine how implementing free will as a neuro right can effectively expand the current protections while at the same time avoiding over-regulation. And regarding the last challenge, uh, that of free will versus cognitive liberty, uh, uh, while free will entails an ontological conception of personal autonomy, cognitive liberty refers either to practical freedom of thought or to specific practical choices. My proposal is to explore conceptual links between the rights of free will and cognitive liberty uh, by analyzing whether they are mutually exclusive or complementary or interdependent. So I am aware that these are five Herculean challenges, so to speak. Um, and it is, of course, possible that no agreement can be reached on them. But even if this happens, they will have been useful to reach an agreement that there is no agreement, and consequently to seek alternatives to the so-called right to free will. Now, in the last part of my presentation, I will try to illustrate how the difference between a more demanding concept of personal autonomy, that is free will, and a less demanding and more specific one, that is uh, cognitive freedom, may influence the specific case of criminal recidivism and related public policies. This is also related to a term and theoretical approach that I recently proposed along with a colleague at the National Institute of Criminal Sciences of Mexico. Her name is Aura Ruiz. We presented our, our approach, our proposal at some uh, journals uh, in Spain, but Additionally, we have also presented our ideas in English at the Journal of Science and Law, edited by the CELO team at Houston. Um, in what follows, I will be reading some excerpts uh, from this article. So, what is uh, our approach? An initial question is, is it possible to apply measures that do not only pursue a, retributive, a retributive punishment based on the assumption that we have free will, but also can help to first reduce the risk of recidivism by serving as complementary measures to the penalty, and two, reduce incarceration rates without endangering public safety. Is it possible to apply measures to achieve these two goals? This is the initial question. Uh, our proposal is to conceptualize the risk assessment of recidivism and of criminal acts in general from what we call neuroprevention. Uh, this term, as far as I know, has only been applied in the health sciences and not in criminal sciences. So in a, in a sense, uh, Aura, Rith and me are coining a new term, so to say. Uh, this is a paradigm that, although based on assumptions related to the use of neuroscientific instruments uh, for the prediction of crime, introduces different conceptual and philosophical nuances that we believe may be useful for the implementation of public policies that aim to fairly balance security with a respect for the rights of the prisoner or probation. But very important. To define neuroprevention, we should first uh, define and understand what is neuroprediction. In recent times, uh, criminologists and psychologists 
have been carrying out the important but controversial task of attempting to predict criminal behavior by hypothesizing about a person's future patterns of behavior or about particular actions based on the presence or absence of risk factors. Your prediction involves the search for possible markers of delinquency or recidivism through several neuroscientific methods, predominantly imaging-based, such as the following, study of the degree of activation in certain brain areas, such as amygdala, anterior temporal cortex, singular gyrus, left inferior frontal gyrus, ventral stuarium, etc. Uh, Multivoxel pattern analysis, MVPA, a, stati a statistical model applied to fMRI images obtained from cognitive tasks in order to do mind reading, the so-called mind reading, and chemical and gen genetic analysis. This is a complementary analy analysis, um, which is based on uh, analyzing the role of norepinephrine or cortisol or the so-called uh, Mao Agen. But what are the implications of neuroprediction at the semantic level? Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary uh, defines predict in its meaning number two as to foretell, prophecy, announce beforehand an event, etc. Uh, we could then by we could then define neuroprediction by adapting the previous definition as to foretelling prophecy and or announcement beforehand of a criminal event in the light of neuroscientific tools and evidence. This, in our in our opinion, this implies a deeply deterministic, even fatalistic interpretation of individual behavior, assuming in practice that criminal acts whose risk is being assessed will necessarily happen. But there are not uh, only semantic implications, but also public policy implications, which I will summarize. Um, although neuroprediction is based on your scientific knowledge, uh, there is no doubt about it. Its approach may allow for misinterpretations by which some policymakers or citizens may believe uh, that neuroprediction is intended to know with absolute certainty which specific behaviors will be carried out by an individual. In our view, this may lead to a, um, to a stigmatization of the prisoner or probation. A criminal act not yet happened would be considered inevitable, thus classifying the individual as someone inherently dangerous and consequently as someone whose essence or identity must be modified. Furthermore, there is an underlying reductionist view according to which mental, volitional and cognitive life would be reduced to the nervous system or even more reductionist to the brain. Uh, on the contrary, it must be recognized that crime is contextual. The external manifestations of such biological factors also depend decisively on an individual's social and physical environment. Here are some additional public policy issues uh, or implications. Uh, a very important implication in, in, in Ruth's opinion and mine, uh, neuroprediction can lead to a paradoxical interpretation of the legal policies related to recidivism and criminal acts. Uh, we think that neuroprediction becomes paradoxical when it implies both that the future criminal act will necessarily occur because the offender cannot impede its occurrence, and at the same time, at the same time, this criminal act will not necessarily occur because the legal system can impede its occurrence. So the system is uh, it, giving itself the power to change the course of future events that at the same time, it considers to be largely inevitable. Uh, this paradoxical idea 
as we see it, may even transform into a dangerous idea. It could be exploited um, by certain powers in the, or, individuals, or individuals to legitimize through a manipulative interpretation of scientific evidence, dictatorial practices in which citizens should accept that they are incapable of making their own decisions about their futures. That is, they don't have free will. And that the system and their rulers should make those decisions in their place. So uh, this situation, remember us to the one uh, that appears in the well-known film, the well-known movie, Minority Report, in which, uh, well, we should only, uh, we should only change the precox uh, role in this film and uh, introduce a neuroscience as if it was the precox in this film. Uh, and the situation would be very similar in our opinion. So uh, these are the neuroprevention definition and implications, uh, always speaking uh, from our point of view, obviously. Um, so in contrast, we are proposing to introduce a new paradigm called uh, neuroprevention, which would be the semantic implications of neuroprevention. Well, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary, again, is defining prevention in, in its meaning number three as action or occurrence before or in anticipation of the expected, appointed, or normal time. Accordingly, we propose to adapt this uh, definition and defining neuroprevention as an action taken by legal system operators in anticipation of an expected, not determined, criminal behavior in the light of neuroscientific tools and evidence. Uh, according to this definition, there is no implicit acceptance of the inevitable here, uh, which is prediction. Uh, rather, the emphasis is placed on anticipating the possible or probable, never conclusively determining. Uh, this is solely a definition. We think that it's very important to expand upon this definition and go on to uh, which are the essential components of this paradigm. Uh, as we have proposed in the, in the uh, aforementioned article, neuroprevention invites the implementation of a comprehensive policy that should do three things. First, always consider not only biological factors, not only neurobiological factors in this case, but also environmental and social factors in pursuit of a global non-reductionist approach. A second thing is to allow regular and methodical monitoring of the various cognitive traits with criminogenic relevance with the aim of suppressing or at least sufficiently reducing their influence on the occurrence of criminal behaviors. And a third important component in our opinion, is the following, uh, which is to facilitate the management by justice system operators in the following areas, Criminolo criminological investigations focused on understanding criminal behavior, procedures for assessing liability and information on sentences, and early detection of risk factors that allows timely interventions in favor of the alleged criminal or person deprived of liberty through the application of training practices, training practices in cognitive skills aimed at reducing these factors. This last part of the paragraph is very important uh, in my view. So in sum, which is the objective of neuroprevention? The objective uh, of neuroprevention is a double objective. More concretely, the objective is that measures and strategies can be adopted for not only improving public safety, which is an important uh, goal, is an important objective, but also uh, for offering the prisoner or professional a real scientifically based opportunity to reintegrate into society by providing better incentives. 
a key strategy uh, to achieve the second goal in, in uh, my colleagues and my opinion is to adequately attend the needs of the offender by implementing rehabilitation programs aimed to improve dynamic cognitive factors relevant to offense. We think that, uh, uh, that a recent paper by a team from the Center for Neuroscience and Law, the, the so-called CELO team, uh, which is led by Professor David Eagleman, uh, we think that this paper illustrates that the approach we propose uh, is not an utopian, uh, an utopian scheme and that it can be supported by evidence. Despite the title of this publication referring to predicting reoffense, we actually think this work is an example of what, of what the neuroprevention of crime should be. This team, this team used a tablet-based tablet software program composed of seven neuropsychological tests to evaluate various criminogenic factors such as risk-seeking, risk impulsivity, uh, aggression, empathy, etc. in order to establish the risk of recidivism in uh, 730 probationers from Houston, Texas. The, the effectiveness of this neurocognitive risk assessment or NCRA uh, was found to be equal to be equal to or better than that of several well-known paper-based assessment tests, such as, for example, the PCRI, uh, PCRA, uh, Compass, WRAN, and LSIR, to name just a few. This tool has the added advantage of cost effectiveness since it is self administered in groups and requires little supervision and training from the operators. But what makes this research even more interesting is that the evaluated factors are dynamic and subject to improvement through adequate intervention and also that it ignores this tool ignores other factors such as legal antecedents race unemployment or educational status so there is no room here for unscientific tools such as criminal records and opaque methodologies such as black box uh, black box algorithms uh, rather, the NCRA applies neuroscientific methods with public safety in mind, but also at the same time avoids the stigmatization of the probationer by taking their past out of the equation and focusing on which factors should be trained to facilitate their reintegration into society. These two aims, in our opinion, give this tool the best of both worlds, just as neuroprevention aspire, uh, aspires to achieve. So in sum, uh, we can summarize uh, which are the definitions of, for neuroprediction and neuroprevention and to uh, compare uh, each other. And we could briefly say that the main goal of neuroprediction is to improve public safety by assessing the risk of a criminal event. But that the main goal of neuroprevention would be to improve public safety by reducing the risk of a criminal event. In our opinion, it is an essential difference between the two paradigms. Uh, let me say that I am not against the use of the tools that in recent years have been used to try to study the risk of uh, recidivism. Uh, I think that the great experts uh, in neuroprediction have done an incredible job. Uh, rather, what I am trying to point out is that the theoretical background um, and understanding of human behavior uh, is important and can decisively influence uh, how the study of Recidivism is received by policymakers and citizens. 
Also, our proposal is not merely semantic in nature, since it brings with it a comprehensive approach to how risk assessment should be applied. Uh, but even if the proposal is limited only to semantics, uh, we cannot ignore that prevention has less strong and demanding implications than prediction. Hence, both policymakers and citizens could be more receptive and less reluctant to its systematic implementation. We are convinced that our approach would make it easier for all stakeholders to realize uh, that the advances in neuroscience suggest exciting paths for the law, paths toward a more beneficial, flexible, and human justice system, one with a more complete and in-depth view of criminal behavior. Uh, I am arriving to the final, uh, to the end of my presentation, uh, but I would like to stress uh, clearly what is, uh, in my opinion, the role of the concept of free will when we applied it to the concrete uh, study of risk assessment. Uh, let's imagine or, or let's accept that prisoners or professionals do have free will, that people in general have free will. Let's accept this. This could bring with it uh, an important problem, which is that of retributive punishment that undervalues biological factors. This is a problem which has been stressed by many, uh, by lots of uh, researchers and, and lawyers. Um, an additional problem is uh, uh, that of conceptual, cultural, and regulatory issues related to the philosophical problem of free will, as we mentioned earlier. Now think on the opposite uh, option, uh, that is that people in general and prisoners or professionals uh, uh, in particular don't have free will. If we accept this, we then have the problem of the use of neuroprediction and the issues related to the public policies uh, that are related to uh, neuroprediction. Particularly, as I have mentioned uh, previously, they are incapable. Uh, this assuming this paradigm would be, would mean that uh, prisoners uh, are incapable of making their own decisions about their futures, and that the system should make those decisions in their place. Importantly, among, among these decisions, uh, we have a decision to be trained in dynamic cognitive factors. This is a very important decision that a prisoner or professional could positively, um, possibly take, um, positively take in order to uh, improve uh, their possibilities to be reintegrated into society. In contrast uh, with, uh, with free will, we have the cognitive liberty paradigm, uh, which when applied to risk assessment has different implications. Uh, let's remember that cognitive liberty comprises two uh, two rights, there are two sides of this uh, right, the positive liberty of uh, using emerging neurotechnologies and the negative liberty of being protected uh, from the coercive and unconsented, uh, unconsented use of such technologies. If we apply the cognitive liberty to risk assessment and not the free will concept, if we believe, if we, uh, um, if we uh, consider that cognitive liberty should be a mirror right of prisoners and not free will, uh, and that free will should not be a mirror right, if we uh, consider this option, then, in my opinion, accepting this would allow to implement neuroprevention. Uh, in the case that prisoners or professionals give their informed consent by exercising their positive right to cognitive liberty in order to improve dynamic cognitive factors relevant to offense 
uh, such as the previously mentioned um, uh, empathy, uh, to say just uh, an example. And this would also allow to avoid the conceptual, cultural and regulatory issues related to free will. So, in short, if we accept, if we introduce free will in the equation of risk assessment, uh, it doesn't matter if free will exists or not exists. In either cases, uh, free will is a problematic uh, conceptual uh, approach to this, uh, to this practical problem. But in my view, cognitive liberty is a less demanding form of personal autonomy that could bring with it uh, interesting uh, applications when applied to risk, uh, risk assessment. So my conclusion, should free will be a human right after all? I, as I said, I agree with the general framework according to which neuro rights may be necessary. I think that uh, seeking a consensus definition of free will is a difficult task, an Herculean task maybe, but an exciting task after, after all. I have proposed five lines of action as a suggestion to contribute to the discourse, to contribute to the uh, discourse about the consensus definition of free will. But in the meantime, and I think it, it is the most important corollary of uh, my talk, in the meantime, I think we should avoid ontological claims such as free will and apply less demanding approaches such as cognitive liberty to specific practical problems, such as risk assessment. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, I think that uh, this, uh, this proposal is a pragmatical one. Uh, I think that uh, debating on, uh, on hard ontological concepts, strong ontological concepts, such as free will, it's a very interesting uh, topic, uh, this amazing event is uh, a very good example of this, uh, but I think that also it is of interest to think about pragmatical approaches uh, applied to specific problems. Uh, so here I end my presentation. Um, I apologize if at any point my argument could not be fully understood uh, as I am not a native speaker of English or Portuguese. Uh, I may have caused you to lose in translation. Uh, in any case, I hope that the topic has been of interest uh, to you. Muito obrigado. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much, Professor Jose Muñoz. Uh, it was a mind-blowing presentation, especially for us that uh, are in law field. Uh, and for me, uh, it was a very interesting speech. Uh, I agree with you with the general framework in neural rights. And I, I deeply agree with the importance of the theme. I had no doubt that neural rights are an important uh, theme for us to, to research, but I must confess that, that I, I wasn't so sure that if uh, this theme was also an urgent uh, question. And uh, hearing you today, uh, it seems pretty clear to me that we have not just an important, but also an, an urgent matter uh, to, to discuss and debate. And, and hearing that, I see the, the initiatives like the one you mentioned, like the, the project of law in 1229 by Congressman uh, Carlos Enrique, the, it, it, uh, in which he proposed to, to change some things in, in, in our LGPD bill. 
well, this discussion may be uh, an urgent matter, and, and it was really great and a provocative uh, speech to hear about it. Uh, I have many, many questions, and uh, perhaps I'm going to use my birthday prerogative to, to start with two questions, not just one. <laughs> uh, and my first question, uh, I will soon pass the word to Professor Renato that, that I see uh, he's raising, raising his hands. Also, Professor Thomas are raising his hands, but I will address my questions first and, and, and soon pass the word to you, Professor Jose Munoz. And, and you, you presented us a very, very provocative uh, concept in which you, you named it neuroprevention. And, and made a comparison uh, and compared it to the neuro prediction, prediction, which is perhaps more controversial, uh, uh, an even more controversial concept. And hearing you, I, I remember the the work of David Eagleman that you cited as well, and he has a, a very well known book here among us, which is called Incognito, uh, and in this book. Professor Eagleman addresses uh, a very interesting point of, of view. Uh, for Professor Eagleman, you, you have certain uh, crime situations that the, the, the criminal, or the burglar, for instance, uh, in, in Eagleman's opinion, has no free will. Uh, his general proposal is to, to, to reduce the, the free will spectrum. And, and his of course, you are uh, you know his works, but but for those who doesn't work, Dave, who doesn't know Dave Eagleman's work, I will briefly uh, introduce just to, to uh, address my question. So, uh, what Dave Eagleman is saying is that uh, in some situations, the criminal is facing an opportunity and, and an opportunity that, for his biological condition and for his brain, there is no chance. Uh, for him to resist the, to practice the crime. So uh, in the streets, if, if a burglar saw an old man and, 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 and then he pick, uh, pickpockets his, his, his wallet, for instance, uh, in Dave Eagleman's point of view, that situation does not involve free will because the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex of the burglar has some uh, conditions that uh, uh, doesn't allow him to, to impose the, the, the necessary constraints to avoid the criminal conduct. So uh, in face of that, what does Eagleman says? Uh, he says, well, well, if there is no free will, so uh, we cannot just uh, put this kind of, type of, kind of criminal in jail. Uh, we must uh, address him in uh, different uh, so social measures and then he proposed something like the, the NCRA you, you already mentioned. So instead of placing the, the criminal in jail, we were going to, to offer alternative social uh, measures to, to avoid incidents and, and to uh, try to put the criminal back in society. Well, the, so the first question I, I propose is, how does your work approach or how's, how does the neuroprevention concept and your work uh, approach to that proposal from Professor Eagleman? Are we, are we talking the same concepts? Because it, it caught my attention that in the concept of neuroprevention, you mentioned anticipating measures. Uh, and then it seems to me that for Eagleman, you must be sure that you are in front of uh, a criminal agent. So uh, for Eagleman, the, the, the crime must be made and then you are proposing some measure. And it wasn't so clear to me that in neuroprevention, the crime, I, I, I'm sure that the ones uh, that practice, uh, that made some criminal conduct uh, will be uh, the, the subject of the neuroprevention. Uh, so that, that's my first question. How does your work approach to Eagleman's work? There are differences, there are not. The neuroprevention is the same idea uh, David Eagleman is addressing or not. And, and the second question I have is a, a more conceptual one, uh, as I, I told you in the beginning. Uh, 
it also caught my attention that Professor Gabriel, before we started and, and we are finishing the Professor Marcel Brass, Marcel Brass presentation, and, and Professor Gabriel says, now we are going to shift course. We are moving towards neural law. And, and also in the beginning of your presentation, Professor Munoz, you uh, opposed, it seems to me that you opposed neural law and neural rights, or, or at least in the presentation, they, they were placed in different positions. I, 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 it wasn't clear to me if you want, wanted to mark some conceptual differences between that, those two points. But my question, my second question is, uh, how do you see the neural law concept in face of concepts of like neuroethics? Uh, are we in face of a new field? And if we really are, does that this new field encompass neuroethics or it's in other sense, does neuroethics encompass neural law? They are not related. And in, in this view, the neural rights are a subject of neural law or we are talking about different fields just for me to clarify this question, which is from my personal interest. But most of all, congratulations once again for this mind blowing talk. I, I'm amazed and I hope to have time for more questions like that. Thank you very much, Professor. You have. Uh... Thank you very much, Leonardo, for your uh, interesting, for your kind words, <laughs> first of all, and for your two interesting uh, questions. Well, in regard to uh, how my proposal of uh, neuroprevention relates to um, the approach by David Eagleman, well, the idea is not to anticipate uh, possible crimes by those uh, who have not uh, committed a crime. Uh, the approach is uh, rather to try to anticipate new crimes, to anticipate recidivism by people who has yet uh, committed a crime, who is, uh, who is in jail, to say so. So uh, this is the initial approach. It, it is interesting because in, uh, in previous talks uh, um, for uh, some people in, in Latin America, more concretely in, in Mexico, this concept has uh, been of interest to some people. And, and they asked to me, uh, could we apply the neuroprevention paradigm to other situations such as, the, uh, such as um, public policies related to um, families, uh, I'm, I am thinking about, for example, uh, uh, violence in the, in the familiar uh, uh, home violence. Uh, my response was, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that this, this could be applied to those uh, realms because uh, we are facing many fundamental rights. Uh, people should be... Uh, should be willing to be applied these tools. So uh, we we do need. I am not a, a lawyer, but but I think that from the um, from the law point of view, we need solid uh, reasons to ask uh, anyone that uh, these tools be applied to him or her. Uh, so, uh, in sum, I think that uh, my approach is may be similar to Eagleman approach. Uh, this is my uh, To the second question, and um, which are the, the relationship between neural law and neural rights and neural ethics and, and, and neural law? Well, uh, in my slide, in, in the slide of Alice, uh, I, I was trying to make a contrast between neural law and neural right just because um, the prefix is the same, neural. And I was trying to uh, depict uh, like this, the difference between neural law and neural right, but I think that uh, I think that neural neural rights, the neural rights, uh, the neural rights topic uh, would fall inside the neural law uh, as a as a discipline. I think that neural law, also called a ne a law and neuroscience, would encompass uh, traditional problems in in, in neural law, such as uh, the 
the aforementioned, uh, just as the, the problem of recidivism, for example, and also the new problems faced by the neural rights uh, proposals. Uh, regarding the neuroethics, neuro law uh, relation, uh, it is a very exciting uh, question because many in the neuroethics, uh, in the neuroethics uh, field would reduce neuro law to neuroethics. Uh, but this is not my view. Uh, I think that neuro law is a very specific application in, or, or could be a specific application uh, of neuroethics, but do need a specific people, specific, uh, do need lawyers working on it. So uh, neuroethicists could not uh, face adequately the problems uh, which arise in neuro law. So I think uh, that they are uh, two disciplines that intersect and at some points, but that should uh, be in different places to say so. This is my view. Thank you very much, Professor. That was very illustrative. And now I'll, I will pass the, the word for our panelists and, and uh, starting by Professor Sinara, uh, which raised his, her hand. Uh, Professor Sinara, the word is with you. Okay, thank you, Jose, <laughs> for this uh, talk, very instigating. Um, I'm not sure, Jose, and maybe I didn't get you right, but uh, I'm not sure that um, the right to free will would challenge neuro prediction. Because at least as you define it here, you said, uh, the right to free will would be the, the right to have the ultimate control over our decisions, yeah? And the uh, uh, neuro prediction doesn't breach this, doesn't breach the ultimate control of our decision. In neuro prediction, as far as I understand, uh, the problem here is that you access the people, you access the minds of, I mean, you know, you access the images and, the, you know, the, to realize, to see, to study the mind and to see if these people have a predisposition or not. But this wouldn't affect you know, the right of the people to uh, make their own decisions. Uh, then, uh, because you use this to say that, uh, well, in this sense, you think that the concept of the idea of uh, um, uh, conceptual liberty, yeah, no, it's not conceptual liberty in this uh, 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 cognition, yeah, there will be the other cognition liberty is better than, than uh, the right of free will, yeah. Because in, uh, if you have the right of cognition uh, liberty, yeah, by definition, uh, then you could actually allow uh, your view of neuro uh, prevention. Yeah? But uh, since I think, uh, and I would like you to talk about this, I think that the concept of um, uh, the right to free doesn't affect this. I think that in this point, doesn't matter <laughs> if you use uh, the right of free will or the, fight or the right of uh, uh, cognitive freedom. But having said that, uh, I said that there is another reason why I think the concept of uh, uh, cognitive liberty would be better than uh, to use uh, um, the right of free will. And this is connected, I think, with the Main problem, Jose, that I think that comes from the neurotechnologies nowadays, yeah, that is exactly the development that it has been doing uh, by the big tech companies uh, about uh, 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 this brain machine interfaces that uh, um, Facebook is trying to develop, that, uh, you know, Elon Musk is trying to develop as well, yeah. And in this case, uh, I think that what uh, they are planning for the future, I think for the better or for the worse, is um, the, 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 to construct the uh, reading machines in the, in the last instance, yeah? And I think that uh, this is the big problem because I think that uh, uh, then if you have the right of cognitive uh, liberty, then this would rule out yeah, this assessment to our minds that I think that's the great dangers that came from neurotechnology without our consenting. 
Yeah. And uh, in this case, the right of free will wouldn't say anything about this because it says only about decisions. Then this is my point. Do you understand? I mean, uh, like to say something about this. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sinara. Um, uh, your first uh, question, if I capture your question, was uh, that free, the right to free will, which uh, would entail as, is, as it is defined by the New Rights Initiative, uh, it would include ultimate control, does not undermine uh, neuro prediction uh, because uh, ultimate control is not a, re um, a requirement uh, for the neuro prediction paradigm. Yes. Well, Yes. Uh, it is. It is a very interesting um, thing. I did not think uh, specifically about it, but uh, what I'm saying is not that the right to free will, as it is defined by the neuro rights initiative, as it is now defined, uh, I don't say that this undermines neuro prediction, but I am saying that incorporating free will. As a, con as a concept, whether defined as the neo rights initiative or whether defined another way after a, a consensus debate, to say so, uh, what I'm saying is that free will is problematic in itself when we introduce it at, at, the, at this paradigm. Mm -hmm. This is my, my view. Um, uh, regarding your second, your second um, well, it was not a, a question, it was a suggestion. I, I think it is very interesting uh, well, there are five neural rights, or, or four, if we think about the proposal by Incan and Dorno, but there are five neural rights by the Neural Rights Initiative. One of them is, uh, is, uh, is free will. In my talk, I've been uh, making a comparison or a brief comparison between uh, free will and cognitive liberty, but, that's, but that doesn't mean that the other rights are not interesting for me. In that sense, I think, and I, I think that I made a brief, uh, a brief uh, comment about it. I think that um, measures such like the Brazilian measure in order to protect neuro privacy are in the correct way because I think that the direct to consumer neurotechnologies and other neurotechnologies that have been that that are being developed. Uh, really pose a threat to our privacy. So I think uh, that the other rights are very interesting. Um, and my talk was focused only on one of, of the new rights, but the other rights are absolutely interesting. And, and I'm sure that uh, there will be a lot of debate about them in other talks uh, with other people. Thank you very much. Okay, now also Professor Thomas raised his hand. And Professor Thomas, you have the word. Great Jose, that was, that was great. Uh, like Leonardo, I have uh, more questions than I'm going to have time to ask, but if we can loop back to them, I'll be happy to loop back to them. So these first aren't so much questions, uh, they're strategies, and a bit of it is autobiography. But um, the Cognitive liberty versus free will. So Sonar, I think, correctly suggested you should uh, preference the former to the latter. And indeed, by the end of the talk, I think you'd already, on the last slide, I think you'd moved away from focusing on free will. And here's one reason right off the bat, 10 to 15% of the people, now we can get to the cross-cultural stuff some other time, I guess, but 10 to 15% of people, no matter where you ask people in the world about free will, don't believe in it. So if you make like neuro free will the thing, you're literally losing, you're already creating dissonance among, amongst people that will probably just already antecedently be the sort of people you'd want on board. So if you tell me you want like a, a neuro right to cognitive liberty, like bravo, I'm on board. You tell me you want to be free will, now I got to argue with you about whether we have it. And so just strategically, there's like a strategic, like public policy, public opinion reason to prefer, I think, the not free will framing of all this. Cause you don't, I don't think you don't need it. I mean, in some sense you just, I'm not sure you need it. Um, I mean, we could talk about whether you need it but I'm, I'm not sure that you do. I think there's a version of this where you don't even mention it. And it's about all these other things. So that's one, one suggestion. 
The other, this is broader because this is not just about your talk. This is about all of our talks. I have neuro law in the title of my talk and we're talking about neuro law and that's the way this goes, right? But you talk about neuro prevention. So in, in the paper in 2010 with Gazaniga and Senator Armstrong, and the, I, I'm pretty sure we were the first group to use neuro prediction in a law related paper. And within a year, it was already replaced. This is another strategy. It was replaced with bio prediction. And there's a good reason for that. Because it's not just like neuroscience is this thing. What we're talking about is this broader, like it's going to be behavioral genetics, uh, biology. It's going to be very a very complex thing. And I think because this field got pegged on neuro early, I mean, even Adrian Rain, who's the founding father of neurocriminology, his model is not, neuro, not neurocriminology. It's a biopsychosocial criminology. And so like the prevention you're interested in, I mean, one reason to prefer this very not elegant term is that it gives you what you were worried about with neuro prediction. Look, there are all these other factors that aren't just like in the brain that are in the world. So let's just call it that. We're gonna, we're gonna use predictive models that take into account uh, socioeconomic status, uh, different neurological things, uh, behavioral genetics. It's gonna be a very complex soup. But like whatever the predict the predictions are going to be the most accurate and reliable will be those. It will never just be like a strictly, I don't think a strictly neurological model. And so like neural law itself, this wasn't, like I said, this isn't about your talk. This is about all of our talks. I just worry sometimes that the neuro piece makes it like reductive in a way that's unhelpful. Because then if you talk to like people and like the public about neuro, they think, what, is, what do you even mean? Like you're predicting things with brain things. But if I say, look, it's based on like your personality type. It's based on who and how you're raised. It's based on like genetic predispositions. It's based on like neurological disposition. Like then they think, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's somehow it's not as reductive. I think. So that was the second thing was just like, even if you call it bioprevention, that's better to me because it's already like a move in the right direction explanatorily. So that, those were just suggestions. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. Um, the question was, now, now having said that, let's just, let's just imagine that now what we call it is like biopsychosocial prediction, which is if I'd been given, if I could go back in time, that's what I would have called it. In biopsychosocial prevention, you can't get the uh, latter without the former, and they're just part of the same process. Right. It only I think it's all like so that I guess that was my other the sort of more substantive question was just like um, how could you have preventive measures that weren't antecedently predictive? So that's that those are the main uh, the first two, like I said, were really just suggestions about terminology, but that one's more substantive because I'm not sure what to make of the, the distinction. I mean, I appreciate by the way, I appreciated the semantic difference. So that if um, it might be that one neuroprevention is not as off-putting to people as neuroprediction. I mean, that's a tactical reason to prefer it, which is that I think is there's re there are reasons for that, I think. But above and beyond like just the tactical reason, it doesn't look like you can dissociate them in practice. It's just a function of what we're calling this giant thing we're doing. Or maybe I, maybe I got that part wrong. But like I said, man, the, the, you, your, the talk is amazing because there are all these, like, this is exactly what I think is so exciting about this field is we get to talk like across all these different ways, uh, all these different disciplines and whatever else. So the, the, the talk was great, but that, that's my, that was my take. But like, really, like it was, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to call it neuroprevention if you go that route. Well, I think that before before replying, I think that Gabriel. Uh, I just I just want to give a practical uh, announcement. I mean, we just have more ten minutes in the session, and our simultaneous translator has to rest a little. It's I mean, talking about law, it's part of the labor labor laws of this country. So I mean, and I'll I'll just say that. She will leave the translation exactly at uh, four, but we keep in, we can we invade the coffee break because the discussion is awesome. And I let you, the law guys, I mean, I have plenty of questions, but I let the specialists talk. 
There is a uh, professor Nitamar waiting after Thomas. There is also Bernardo waiting in the in the Q's and A's. Please, let's have the debate. Just we have to liberate our translator for that. Okay, let's just Professor Jose respond to Thomas <laughs> questions, and then we will go back to Professor Nitamar and the Q and A questions. Uh, well, Thomas, thank you very much. Let me say that it's a honor for me <laughs> that you have uh, made these suggestions. You are undoubtedly one of the pioneers of these uh, of these uh, topics. So it's it's really a honor for me. Um, I think your two suggestions are very interesting. Are on on the nucleus of the <laughs> of the thing. So, um, well, the first one. Uh, sorry if I couldn't capture it well. Um, I. I think that you suggested, uh, in short, that we don't or I don't need to appeal to the cognitive liberty uh, in order to undermine the free will uh, paradigm, to say so, because there are many uh, cultural constructs of free will. I, am, I have understood well. It was more that, um, so let's imagine instead what you wanted to say was the human right to autonomy. Let's just call it that. And I think bravo on board, right? Because like most of the things that people who believe in free will believe in are the pieces that make us autonomous agents. I can concede we're autonomous in an important sense. And that's a value we ought to facilitate even if I don't think we have free will. And because there's like a subset of people who are gonna think we don't have free will, given that you could pretty much talk about those agency supporting cognitive mechanisms like autonomy, it makes more sense just to talk about the, the human right of autonomy. That, I, that it was more that. It was just that you, um, you lose some subset of people just in virtue of calling it free will. Whereas if you just described it in terms of the abilities involved, I would think, oh yeah, right, for sure. Like reasons responsiveness, the ability of self-direction, the ability of self-determination, the ability not to be oppressed and all these other things. Then like people are going to think like, for sure, I'm on board with that. So it's more. It was more of that. It was more like you, you could frame it in terms of abilities that didn't involve like referencing free will, and then I think more people would be sympathetic. That that and it also avoids the argument with people who disagree about what free will is or what it requires or whatever else. It literally just like cuts across all that. That was that was the idea. I'm not maybe the thing is I, I wasn't sure I was misunderstanding what was going on, but that like I was trying to follow it from getting in. Like by the end, you even yourself on the last slide were talking about in some sense getting away from talking about free will. And I thought, yes, for sure. That is like the, that is an important piece for you to extend this. So that's what I was thinking. Okay, so uh, I think it's a very interesting point. Uh, I think that uh, independently of what people think about uh, whether we have personal autonomy or not, uh, we, when we are depicting uh, the rights in paper, we need to uh, express the personal autonomy in some sense or another. So I think that in a way um, to incorporate cognitive liberty would be a uh, kind of, 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 of uh, being far of this uh, loaded term of free will is it's a it's a uh, it's a starting point so I think it, it would be a useful tool but this is not a definitive uh, answer uh, from me so uh, uh, I think your suggestions are very interesting as and have uh, have elected me uh, to, to think about it. <laughs> I will think about it in the next days, sure. Um, the second one uh, about the, okay. Yes, you say, well, the neuroprediction uh, paradigm includes by a psychological models. It's not only the neuro, it's, it's, it's bio, it's, it's psycho. Uh, there are more things uh, there. Uh, well, I'm not sure what happens in other countries, but what, when, when I'm, uh, talking about these th these things and about near prediction with other colleagues in in Spain uh, um, and other countries in Mexico, etc. Uh, what I see is that 
especially the lawyers, uh, see these things as only a narrow thing. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a name that always appears that is Lombroso. <laughs> um, they always appeal to Lombroso. You are Lombrosinist. Um, I think that the neuro prevention proposal, uh, I, I think that I say, it, but uh, I think that the neuro prediction tools are absolutely amazing. Uh, not only by the neuro side, uh, but also on the other side, by the bio side and the psycho side. Um, but I think that the neuro prevention uh, would be a useful approach, in my view, to uh, face with this kind of thoughts by lawyers and, and other people. I think that when we approach politicians and we talk about um, potential public policies, uh, semantics do, do really have uh, uh, an important role. So, uh, but, but, I, but I absolutely agree with you that this is not only a neuro thing. Okay, well, before I pass the word to Professor Nitamar, let's see what we have here in the Q&A. Uh, we are approaching to our, our deadline, but I'll be quickly, I will choose one question uh, from our audience. We have here uh, one interesting question from Bernardo Alonso. Uh, in his words, delinquency is quite a vague notion and how neuroprevention will avoid stigma since preventing some probability of having naughty, not naughty thoughts, uh, like it's on a, a clockwork orange uh, film reference, uh, will potentially harm the very core of what is understood as cognitive freedom. And that's the question from Bernardo addressing to you, Professor Jose. The word is with you. Okay, I'm reading the, the question. Um, well, about drug leg leg uh, legalization, I have no concrete answer. Uh, I think this is not my, uh, my concrete topic. Uh, there, are, uh, there are interesting views uh, that will be soon be published about this by some uh, researchers in Mexico. Um, uh, in this publication, well, in this publication is defended that uh, drug legalization would be um, based in, uh, upon, among other things, upon uh, cognitive liberty. And the second one, the linguist is quite about the notion how new prevention will avoid. Well, well, just I, a brief word, Professor Jose, it's because I skipped the first question and, and maybe the audience doesn't know it. I would just read the first question before you answer the second, the second okay. one. Okay. Sorry. And the first question that uh, Bernardo addressed was, uh, cognitive liberty is an important notion long since pioneers writings on consciousness explorations such as Alan Watts, Aldous Huxley, and William Barrett. And what are your views on drugs legislation? And, and we had already the answer from Professor Munoz, and now we're gonna have the answer in the second questions, which I, I read previously. Well, um, as I said in a, in a slide, I think that if we think about prediction in a literary um, way, this is a risk uh, because we could consider uh, people inherently dangerous uh, because they are determined to do things. So um, if we think about it from the neuroprevention uh, paradigm, uh, we are introducing the fact that the prisoner uh, could take decisions to change the future. So it is not uh, that he or she is inherently dangerous because he could uh, change uh, the future events. So in, in this way, I think that prevention uh, in a semantic way is, uh, is less problematic and it is not as related to uh, delinquency or inherent dangerousness. 
Okay, thank you very much, Professor Jose. We we are approaching our deadline, but but we cannot end without uh, having the question from Professor Nitamat. Do we have time, as, Professor? As I, as I said, I, I mean, we can we can go. We can enter the the coffee break. We just cannot have translation. So I mean, this is a Socratic meeting. Jose Manuel Muñoz gave us a beautiful conference. We will not stop the debate. <laughs> Please keep keep going, keep going. Well, following Professor Gabriel's orders, uh, I will pass the word to Professor Nitamar. It's a pleasure to have you have the word. Professor Nitamar, you're muted. Leonardo. Well, thank you, Professor Munoz. Uh, I had a question. It is more like a background question relating to the five challenges you mentioned to the legislation of free will, especially after you mentioned that uh, you thought yourself that there was, it was going to be very difficult to reach full agreement. Now, are you assuming that uh, these are challenges cannot be overridden at all, or is it possible to make concessions, say, among some of these challenges. I, I was thinking especially uh, very much in the direction of uh, what Thomas uh, mentioned in his uh, comments and question, uh, in the sense that uh, if you take free will as a belief that is not uh, shared by most people or by all members of a community, uh, it, it, wouldn't that be very much like, uh, let's say, uh, freedom uh, of uh, religious uh, beliefs as well, uh, that you no know, people might believe or not in some kind of uh, religious entity or divinity. And yet, uh, in so far as uh, legislation is concerned, you always think that you no know, people are allowed to believe whatever they want to believe. Um, I am not sure that I captured your question. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, the five challenges that you remember, you, we, you had several slides about the five challenges to the uh, legislation of free will. My question is, uh, how do you relate challenge the other? For instance, you mentioned uh, cultural, uh, social background, etc. If you're going to relativize uh, in, to, uh, to a certain extent that you're going to allow for diversity, if, it's go if you're talking about liberal democracies, uh, legislation has to be capable of contemplating all different possible uh, views and beliefs not uh, necessarily being shared by all members of said community. Okay, uh, yes, it's a very interesting, uh, uh, it's a very, very, interesting, very interesting point. Uh, well, I think, uh, maybe I will disappoint you, but I think that the work should be done by those uh, who are uh, proposing free will as a new right. I mean, uh, they are proposing a very loaded term uh, as, a new, as a new right. Uh, my work in this talk was to try to illustrate how there are problems arising about this and how could uh, we talk about these things. I have not a definitive answer. I suspect, uh, if I could use this, this term, that we would not arrive uh, an agreement about the, the neural right to free will because there are, uh, exist there are many problems, not only the five that I mentioned, but I'm sure that we will arise uh, more problems in the future. Uh, one of them is uh, that that you mentioned, and is how we could uh, encompass all the cultural expressions in uh, in liberal democracies, uh, and this includes how people see free will and how uh, they think that free will uh, or what free will is. So I I I agree with you. Okay, Professor Munoz, do we have time for more questions? 
you have talked for more than two hours. I would try to, to, to end this with uh, one more question for Marcia. Can we have it? Uh, and uh, the Marcia is arguing that by restricting to those who have already criticized a crime, isn't it a way to consider all those criminals as potential repeat offenders? Why this would be, uh, I think she's referring to, to your concept, uh, why would it be uh, applicable only to criminals rather than to anyone? Is there any similarity to the Lombroso's theory? Well, uh, the answer to this is that uh, the new prevention uh, should be applied to those who are uh, maybe in jail. And this is uh, addressed to the possibility of that these people could have uh, permission to to go to to go home before uh, their uh, their um, I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not uh, I not have the word um, um, su condena <laughs> before their um, uh, well, I, I they're, they're, con they're sentenced, they're condemnation. Oh, the, they're sentences. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Gabriel. Uh, it is an opportunity for the for these people to to go home before their their sentences uh, finish. So, in this sense, I think it could help people to 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 go home uh, if they have achieved to um, enhance these cognitive traits that I previously mentioned. So, I think it's a positive thing. Professor Munoz, that was a, an astonishing presentation, really provocative and really mind-blowing questions. Uh, I, I would have a thousand questions here, but I'm really worried about the time. Uh, I, I see uh, one more question here. Uh, Professor Gabriel, do we have just, time? Just a word before that. I mean, we had all the, 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 the publicity material ready, and we were waiting for Jose Manuel Munoz's confirmation because Renato, he was full of commitments. Renato was trying to, to make it happen. We are very happy that we waited for Jose Manuel Munoz's confirmation because it was a terrific, terrific talk. Thanks a lot, Jose. Thanks a lot. Gracias. And please, Leonardo, take the lead. Thank you to, to all of you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your amazing uh, suggestions and questions and for your invitation. It has been a pleasure for me. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado. It was an honor, Professor. Thank you very much. Congratulations for your talk. And we'll Thank be back in 21 minutes. Thank you very much.